Oh my god, I'm talking so much. I'm very thirsty. <coughs> Hey, what's up party people? Check out my pile of clothes at the back. Anyway, this is, I would say, a continuation of UK versus Singapore, but university edition. So I've been in uh, university here for the past two and a half years, coming three years already. Time has really flown by. And this is a summary of my experiences and comparing it to studying in Singapore University. Hey guys, so before we start the video, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Lit Active. Um, they provided some of the clothes to unbox. Sorry, mental problem right now. The first thing that they gave me was these pair of cute shorts, blue color shorts. They're great for like everyday homeware and like the strings a bit different as compared to other providers. I just like the colour blue actually. Moving on, this one is a bit more peculiar but it's actually one of my favourite pieces from Lit. I see a lot of girls wearing it on Instagram but it's basically like a calf cardigan and it's great for like dresses and stuff and it just looks like a very nice piece that you can add. Next, actually I think I also really like this. Um, this is a pair of cargo pants. The material is super lightweight and it doesn't feel like heavy so it's great for like hot weathers like Singapore. It's in a nice beigey colour. There's a couple of pockets as well. As you know, cargo is coming back in trend I see all over TikTok at the moment. And Lastly, since it's called Lit Active, they gave me a sports bra as well. Okay, so we got like a quite a lot of questions to answer but I basically broke down this video into a few parts. So the first part is the application process. What am I studying? Is it self-funded or am I on a scholarship? What is the uni curriculum like? safety and racism, uh, finances, internship process, dating culture, difficulty and differences. Application process is pretty straightforward if you took A-levels in a junior college. So all you have to do is take your A-levels and apply through the system of UCAS. For a diploma, I'm not too sure how that works, but it is also pretty straightforward from what I hear from my poly friends that come to study here. Generally speaking, you have to get one grade higher than your British counterparts because A-levels in Singapore is less recognised as the A-levels done in the UK. The visa process after getting your application is pretty straightforward. So you need to get accepted first and once you get accepted, UCAS will send you a letter and you have to go to the embassy to sort out um, your application process, it takes about uh, one to two months and you have to get a BRP. So a BRP is like a UK IC that you carry around to identify that you have a student visa. Okay, so what am I studying? I am basically studying media and communications. However, in Goldsmiths, they have different practical specializations that you do. So I'm currently doing a film, a screen fiction practical. So you have to make a short film at the end of year three. There are other practical skills that you can learn as well, like photography, journalism, etc, etc. The reason why I chose Goldsmiths as a university versus um, other places is that most universities in the UK, they don't really have a media course. It's also quite a recognised art school. The unique thing about this course is that they allow you to create a short film at the end. So most other film schools, you have to either go fully film or you do communications which is more like PR, marketing and like business sites. Another question that I got, am I self-funded or am I on a scholarship? So initially, I actually applied for a scholarship when I just graduated from A-levels because I wanted to study in America. However, I didn't have the guts to apply for a scholarship in the end. That's why I took a gap year and then I went to SMU. But there are tons of uh, scholarships available up for grabs. I just am not too sure about it because um, they probably have changed in the last couple of years, like the standards and the application process. If you're looking to get a scholarship, I would say focus a lot on your grades and your extracurricular activities. Like for example, I did a lot of extra shit in junior college, like starting a magazine, 
Um, I also <laughs> was a student counsellor, so I had to organise events. Hated it, it was fucking dreadful. On top of that, you're expected to have perfect grades, so at least aim to get perfect grades. So I got AAB, so that is like 85 rank points, which is quite good for Catholic Junior College standards. However, I think when you're applying for like major scholarships like Changi or Mindef, which are all government bonded, it is a safer bet to get A, straight A's, like 90 rank points, because you are competing with like the cream of the crop. Like you're competing with people from like Raffles, Hua Chong, AC, so like, have something that would truly differentiate you from the pack, so yeah. The curriculum in UK versus the curriculum in Singapore. So the curriculum in Singapore, based off my SMU experience, it was highly competitive, uh, I was very very stressed out. It was bidding, so you bid for uh, modules, so you have a set amount of points given to you every semester and then you bid. So you really need to plan what courses you're doing and how you're going to bid for certain subjects. Because SMU has a very competitive energy, it uh, kind of fosters a lot of like intimidation with the bidding. So you have to overbid and underbid sometimes and once you overbid, you can't overbid that much because you only have a select amount of points and sometimes you want to take an elective so moving on to my second point SMU allows you to take on elective so for local universities like SMU, NUS and NTU you're able to take on elective modules such as learning a new language or like arts and crafts something in those arenas and it's covered by the school curriculum compared to the UK UK does not have this practice so basically you're given a set amount of modules every term. You just bid for the stuff. You don't even bid, you select the modules that you want to do. And that's it. So you are not able to take on extra work um, because it's not a GPA system. It is based out of fixed amount of 100 points. Yeah. So it's like second upper, first upper, first class. So SMU was a very new school. Not that new, but the compound is extremely new. So everything in the school is very well organized. It's a beautiful campus. It's close to everywhere. It's in town. Very accessible. Tons of facilities. Amazing school gym. Three floors. Tons of study areas. Whereas, because I'm at Goldsmiths, so we kind of have like an internal management issue. So I would say the facilities aren't great. Um, the teachers, however, are fantastic. If you were to go to a school like UCL or King's College, where the fees are slightly higher compared to my school, the facilities are very good. But you're gonna pay like £3,000 more than me per semester, so it kind of adds up. I'm not really concerned with these kind of things because I don't really study in UK University. The other point, UK University is a breeze. UK University is a breeze. Thank you right now, fucking easy. Like, I think because I was studying so hard already in A-levels, it really prepped me for university in the UK because I'm in a media course and when I was in junior college, I was doing humanities. So being a pure humanities student, I was shooting up like four essays a day for practice and it just put me into a mood where like my brain is able to analyze questions really well. However, when you go to the university, it's somewhat different. Like, you have to learn how to analyze um, reports and academic writing. However, with the skill base that I have gotten in A levels, it was very easy for me to convert those skills. So, it's pretty standard to get a B. It's harder to get an A, obviously. Once you get the knack of what they want in school, so like, meeting your professors and like going through essay writing what they specifically look out for they really like heavy on referencing so if you are able to reference every point that you made you're guaranteed to do really well i would say like generally i have tons of free time in this country in singapore i would study like six to eight hours every day for subjects like statistics and like management now i barely i barely study like <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. A good thing is that it has given me a lot of time to do whatever I want. And the bad side of it is probably I'm very fucking bored. I don't feel like I am being pushed to my maximum capacity. However, with the time that I now have, I'm able to explore and travel. I am able to go out more and hang out with my friends. 
So you kind of have to find like a sweet balance between the both. Like getting into a routine for me really helps set myself in a productive mood and for me being productive makes me feel happy about myself. At the moment, I only have like three more months left of university and I am writing my dissertation. So one thing that I really enjoy about um, UK curriculum is that it's very open-ended. Um, I'm In the past two and a half years, I learned about a lot of things I would not be able to learn about in Singapore. For example, I learned a lot about gender studies, I learned a lot about queer and feminist theories. I am able to meet very amazing um, professors that are renowned in the academic world at my school. And that's another plus point about studying in the UK is that the professors are highly, highly respected in their fields and you're able to interact with them. You have options to delve deeper into your course of study. The way the curriculum is taught is to focus on nurturing your own point of view and ideas instead of relying on textbook. So you're able to just bounce off ideas with your professor very easily versus um, I guess being in Singapore there's a bit more like structure and organization in the learning which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's good to have a mix and match of both. Like sometimes when I'm in class I do miss like having more structure and people taking more initiative to answer questions. Okay that's another point. Seminars are quite dry. I think probably because of COVID as well, like people don't really want to talk anymore. <laughs> uh, but if you take the effort to do your readings and be present during class, it goes by very quickly. Yeah. Uni culture. Okay, so uni culture, um, I wrote down which is more fun. Definitely fun in both ways. Like if you are someone that has the urge to be abroad, then obviously it's going to be fun if you're in another country and then you don't feel stifled in Singapore because when I was in Singapore, I felt quite stifled, that's why I left. However, I did and really enjoy myself in SMU because I was able to make really close friends that I still talk to to this day even though we barely hang out, like we still make contact and establish a good relationship. In Goldsmiths, it was much harder for me to make friends but I think it's because of my uni. Um, speaking to other people from different universities is like a completely different experience. So... For example, um, I have friends who study in like uni-based towns, so your entire life is about university. So it's very easy to make friends in that kind of environment because they kind of foster the community already and there's like a lot of activities that people do together. So for me, when I first moved, I didn't really go for any freshman games or whatever So because it's optional. So I was spending more, a lot of my time with my mom on Hindsight, I shouldn't have done that because it caused me to isolate myself. You really have to take initiative to make friends in this country. It's not, it doesn't happen for you. You really have to put yourself out there, which can be very intimidating. However, it's worth it. Like, I mean, like you don't want to be lonely in a new country. It is easier to make friends in London, I would say, because before I moved here, I was quite lucky. I already had friends here, so it's easy for me to just make more friends through different friendship groups and just extend yourself outwards. Going for parties is also another way to make friends because um, UK does have a culture of partying a lot and yeah a lot of my close friends now are also made from parties or from like shoots and stuff like working. Getting a part-time job also helps you make friends and it's like a process like I wouldn't say you meet like your best friend on the first day. Um, it took me a long time to establish strong friendship bonds because as young adults, it is something that you really have to take an effort to do. So don't be discouraged. I was like super depressed when I first moved here. I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna die of loneliness. Like, no one wants to be my fucking friend. And I was really close to my roommate in first year, but she moved out. Don't be afraid to do things alone. Try new things and it causes you to meet new people as well. Like even if it's a small talk with like someone downstairs or your neighbour is so like conversation that lifts your mood up. Safety and racism, I touched on this in my previous video which I'll link here. I get very frustrated when people say that London is not safe. It's obviously not safe compared to Singapore. I think obviously it's never going to be as safe as your home because your home is where you come from and you know the ins and outs of the city. You should also be mindful 
of your belongings and being aware of your surroundings also to just have a strong presence i've been here longer so I, I feel more like a local i don't really get harassed as often as i did in year one when i was living here in year one i think i looked really scared i was getting off very timid right so it was easier to like harass me but i think after a while after living here for a longer time your tolerance just builds up slowly and you have to be also a bit more like daring to tell someone to fuck off like you cannot like quiver you must be like hey you fucking chibai dog get out of my way you know that kind of shit also don't antagonize people i mean like i think generally singaporeans are quite uh, civil in that matter i'm in london so racism is really not that bad here i'm speaking from my own experience because i look kind of caucasian so i cannot really speak for someone who looks super chinese or like super malay or super indian However, I would say that I do get like racist remarks from time to time. More like ignorance. I wouldn't say like they are downright racist. More like, oh, I don't English so good. Um, yeah, I'm from Singapore. They were like, oh, oh like, I didn't know people in Singapore speak English. When I have these conversations, I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt because sometimes they really don't know where Singapore is or they just are unaware of the culture of the country um, due to their own experiences so it's just fine I just tell them as it is and I think during the Asian hate period it was quite scary um, people were like a bit more antagonizing towards Asian people obviously but now it's really very chill like people are like quite anti-racist here um, Londoners especially I wouldn't say like people outside of London because I can't speak for them and also Goldsmith my school is very anti-racist and anti-homophobic and very pro left-wing stuff so um, I'm surrounded by people who are quite mindful of what they say sometimes a bit too mindful but that's up for discussion another time someone did ask me like oh like what if my prof makes a racist remark and stuff like that if that actually does happen you can file a report and get that person fired quite easily and it's because they are fearful of bad press so yeah you can do that and if your friends are friends, schoolmates are uh, like make, being racist towards you, my suggestion is don't take it lightly, like use your platforms to like shun the person and get them cancelled because you can do that very easily nowadays. Okay, planning finances, um, rent food transportation. I'm going to talk about my rent first. So in first year, you are given a few accommodation options and I stayed at Camberwell uh, Homes for Students which cause it was near school. I paid around like 760 pounds per month. So it's 180 per week. I am currently paying 250 pounds for this space with a kitchen and a toilet. But this is after they increase prices for COVID. So this is like a really, really good rate. You can watch my property video to find out more about the house that I'm living in. Second year, I was very lucky. I was able to stay at my friend's place for free. So I did not spend money on rental in my second year. And in my third year now, which is where I'm staying. For budgeting, I don't really have it. <laughs> I try not to spend money but I do. London is like a very expensive city. So in my first year, I was a bit more cautious with my spending. I would write down everything that I spend. And then my roommate Leslie was like, you're never gonna do this like all the time. After like three months, you'll stop. And she was right. After three months, I did stop. I can't really give much advice for budgeting because I don't budget. I just try to spend less than a thousand five every month. However, I'm telling you this because I'm paying from my own pocket money so I don't get pocket money from my mother if not I would be fucking dead right now but essentially I pay for like my own groceries, my shopping bills do add up especially in winter because of electricity they are about like 150 to 200 pounds a month for bills but if you stay home more means you'll spend less so it's like pros and cons eating out in London is also very ex actually it's not very expensive it's similar to Singapore dollar for dollar however like singapore you have the options of eating very cheap you can just go to the hawker center in london it's very rare that you can get something less than three pounds the cheapest thing you can get is probably like mcdonald's or a kebab um if you go further out of london obviously it does get cheaper however you spend more on transport so transport here is very very expensive it is two pound fifty a ride on the train pound fifty-five for a bus journey and the train fucking sucks okay okay it's not sucky lah but like a lot of lines sometimes not operational so there are a lot of delays 
and you have to factor in spending like five pounds every day for transport which is where the, oh my god that's so much money in my first year i did buy the student oyster because i was staying quite far away so you just basically pay an upfront of like 110 pounds a month and you are able to travel free in london so if you stay further away i would suggest getting the student oyster internship process so someone did ask if it was hard to get internship as a foreign student the answer is no it really depends where you apply and it really depends on your grades and your portfolio it's good to have connections as well so like for me, my previous internship, I was interning at a cinema company making TikToks. I got this job through my friend who was working for them. So it's good to make friends who are already working so they can allow a speedier internship process and they can like vouch for you because I feel like if you apply through platforms, it's quite difficult because you're just like another person in like a stack full of people. Internships are fun, I would say. It really depends what you want to do. Like for me, media internships were not the easiest to get. Fashion as well because a lot of people are able to intern for free. And I didn't want to intern for free because like my... I'm doing like quality work, I don't want to intern for free. But you can if you can afford it. I would say it's pretty much the same. I wouldn't say they discriminate between local and a foreigner. If you're applying for a job, after you graduate there's a graduate visa right now so it kind of levels out the playing field and makes life easier but prior to that it was very hard to get a job in England dating culture in London is very different from dating in Singapore in Singapore first men always pay for dates maybe based on my experience because they like know who I am so I can talk shit about them if they don't pay for my date <laughs> but I appreciate the gesture I like when people pay for the first dates second date i'll pay so it's fair you know what i mean unless i really don't like the guy and then i'll ask to split in london it's pretty standard to split for all meals because like people here are very feminist you know like men and women are equal uh i mean yeah i'm writing a fucking essay on this i do like chivalrous chivalrous, <laughs> chivalrous men i may be double standard but I'm really gonna cook, I'm gonna clean, I'm gonna work and on top of that you don't wanna pay for my fucking meal like it really depends okay so if you're going out with someone who is not working or like is a student then yeah obviously like it makes sense to split but if you're going out with a working adult and he doesn't want to buy you a meal that guy is cheap I've been doing that last so, <laughs> so I mean like I'm whining about it now but at the same time it's like I also partake in it but people here don't really have a lot of savings because of paying rental and like living here is very very expensive so you kind of spend a lot of money anyway so I guess there's some reasoning behind besides that how I do I meet people for dates uh, I meet them on dating apps same as Singapore I guess this is like pretty much like post-covid lifestyle like everyone meets on dating apps now which I fucking hate by the way I hate online dating it's like it kills me it kills me that's why I stop like whenever I need attention maybe I'll just go on and use the app but like most of the time it's just like ugh, try to date like friends or friends or like expand my social reach uh, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else dating, 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 dating people sleep around here a lot more than Singapore so sleeping around is very normal here like, people have a lot more fuck buddies I would say dating culture here is a bit more uh, explorative like people like do more shit and like threesome, open relationship, like I hear this kind of thing like all the time. Obviously you have like the normal stuff as well but like you have a tons of people that do other things. I personally think sexual harassment happens a lot more in London than in Singapore even though um, there's a lot of high cases in Singapore. It's like a different style of sexual harassment. Um, I would say Singapore is a bit more like passive like taking videos in the toilet and like sneaking up on women like upskirt. But for UK it's really like quite intense people like roofies like which is a date rate drop and like people get raped a lot I mean, i'm scaring you guys now but like a word of advice never leave your drink on the bar always hold your drink i rarely accept drinks from strangers at the bar unless they're my friends like if a guy wants to buy me a drink which rarely happens by the way i'm telling you now like i never like no guys have ever offered to buy me a drink i don't know why because i'm beautiful make sure you see the bartender pass it to you because more often than not like scary things do happen and don't walk home alone i walk home alone if it's like a five minute walk most of the time if it's late at night take a taxi or if you take public transport make sure you're with someone don't take it alone that's all i have to say 
So yeah, this is UK versus Singapore University edition. Remember to like and subscribe.